here's my plan. My plan is actually to go through all seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we saw so beautifully in that, um, you know, in the Pentecost Novena that we've been saying. So my plan is to go through all seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and talk about the different gifts and what it means. And I figure that'll be a good way to get us up to Pentecost and get us really responsive to praying for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which with any luck at all, we should be able to get more of on Pentecost. So, but I want to start with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are less obvious. Actually, none of them are terribly obvious, but the gift of fear of the Lord and the gift of piety. Gift of fear of the Lord, number one, is uh, not very kind of politically correct today, right? Jesus is your best friend and your soccer coach, and he could never be mad at you. And, uh, you know, he understands. And besides which, you know, he's he's merciful to sinners, so there's really nothing to worry about. And it's uh, not well understood, and it's also probably the one of these gifts of the Holy Spirit that is uh, kind of intentionally ignored, if I can say so. So I'm going to be reading from Dom Guernje, who doesn't suffer from, a, you know, excess of modernism. And he makes it very clear how important the gift of the fear of the Lord is and its role in our salvation. So here goes, and I may interrupt myself a little bit. This is from volume nine of the liturgical year. Let's see how good this camera is. Volume 9 of the Liturgical Year by Dom Guéranger, which you don't have to buy the book. You can uh, download it very easily for free as a PDF file. Okay, The Gift of Fear. Pride is the obstacle to man's virtue and well-being. Okay, that's where we start. We start with pride. Pride is the mother of all sins, right? Pride is what caused... Lucifer to fall from his number one spot in heaven, right? The, the, the greatest, the most glorious creature God created. He fell because of his pride. Pride lies underneath all other sins because, well, you'll see, it's got to do with the fear of the Lord. Because basically, if we choose to sin, we are somehow placing ourselves above God, sort of like what Lucifer wanted to do. Pride is the obstacle to man's virtue and well-being. It is pride that leads us to resist God, to make self our last end, in a word, to work our own ruin. That's it in a nutshell. Humility alone can save us from this terrible danger. Who will give us humility? The Holy Spirit, and this by infusing into us the gift of the fear of God. This holy sentiment is based on the following truths which are taught us by faith. Number one, the sovereign majesty of God in comparison with whom we are mere nothingness. The sovereign majesty of God in comparison with whom we are mere nothingness. If you remember when I had my little interview with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and I expressed amazement at how glorious and exalted she was. What did she say? She said, oh no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing. I'm a creature. I'm a created thing. He's everything. We're not only, um, how does he put it here? We are not only nothingness in relation to God because of how insignificant we are in relationship to God, we're nothingness in relationship to God in a existential way. We're literally nothingness because we don't exist on our own. Only God exists on his own. We are created things created by God. We don't have our own existence. God does have his own existence. So next to God, we are literally nothingness. And if the Blessed Mary, Virgin Mary can say it, we certainly should be saying it. Anyway, number two, the infinite sanctity of that God, in whose presence we are but unworthiness and sin. I'll repeat that. 
the infinite sanctity of God, in whose presence we are but unworthiness and sin. Amen. And if any of you know uh, St. Louis de Montfort, you know, who's behind the um, uh, 30-day consecration to Mary, who's behind uh, true devotion to Mary, you know, the great apostle of the rosary, a wonderful, wonderful saint. Uh, he died in his early 40s. And his last words, as he sat in a chair and died of exhaustion, because he had worked himself to death, um, as uh, you know, uh, as a priest evangelist, his last words were, "Good. At least now I will sin no more." Right? We'll be sinning until our last breath. Anyway. Anyway, so we are. Um, our humility should be based on number two, the infinite sanctity of that God in whose presence we are but unworthiness and sin. Number three, the severe and just judgment we are to go through after death. I hope, I mean, I've talked about it on the show. I hope you know the Dies Irae, which is the sequence which is sung at every Requiem Mass in on in the old rite in the tridentine rite and it's sung even at the funerals of saints and it's um the day of wrath it is a description of the seriousness of our particular judgment when we die you, you know it's terrible that now at funerals it's a celebration of the person's life and a celebration of them being in heaven or even worse, waving with the wheat in the wheat fields. I've heard that in a Catholic church also. But in fact, a funeral should not be, a funeral mass in particular, should not be a celebration of the person's life and a rejoicing that they're in heaven. It should be fervent prayer for the salvation of their soul um, and, and for their release from purgatory, should they be so lucky as to have made it fortunate uh, to have made it into purgatory. So, uh, the severe and just judgment we are to go through after death. Number four, the danger of falling into sin, which may be our misfortune at any time if we do not correspond to grace. For although grace be never wanting, yet we have it in our power to resist it. Now remember, St. Paul, who also was hardly an insignificant saint, said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, that, that um, again, until our last breath, we're going to be sinning. And until our last breath, we could actually fall into mortal sin if we don't correspond to the grace that's given to us to stay out of sin. Continuing with uh, Dom Guernsey. Man, as the apostle tells us, must work out his salvation with fear and trembling. There's that quote. It's from Philippians chapter 2. Man must work out his salvation with fear and trembling. But this fear, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, is not the base sentiment which goes no further than the dread of eternal punishments. It keeps alive within us an abiding compunction of heart, even though we hope that our sins have long ago been forgiven. It prevents our forgetting that we are sinners, that we are wholly dependent upon God's mercy, and that we are not as yet safe except in hope. This fear of God, therefore, is not a servile fear. On the contrary, it is the source of the noblest sentiments. Okay, because there is such a thing as a servile fear, right? Like you're, if you're the slave of a master who's very cruel and always pulling out his bullwhip. Any of you seen Cool Hand Luke? Um you know, you can have fear of that master, but it's a servile fear. But this fear is a very different fear. It is the source of the noblest sentiments, inasmuch as it is a filial dread of offending God by sin. It goes hand in hand with love. Imagine a child who is absolutely adores, absolutely adores his father and is terrified of offending the father is terrified of doing something that displeases the father that is a fear but it is not a servile fear 
It's a fear that goes hand in hand with love. And that's what fear of the Lord is. Okay. Arising as it does from a reverence for God's infinite majesty and holiness, it puts the creature in his right place, and as St. Paul says, it contributes to the perfection of th- the perfecting of sanctification. That's in 2 Corinthians. We have to remember who we are and who he is. He is and we aren't. We're here by his grace. We're here by his tolerance. We're here with him for all eternity, so to speak, if we play our cards right. Um, But we're not on the same level with him. You know, he's not our soccer soccer to- coach or our, you know, our, 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 our doting third grade teacher or anything like that. <laughs> there is a little fear of the Lord that goes hand in hand with love, which should be coloring our relationship to God. Um, it puts the creature in its right place, and as St. Paul says, contributes to the perfecting of sanctification. Hence, this great apostle who had been wrapped up to the third heaven, assures us that he was severe in his treatment of himself, lest he should become a castaway, lest he should lose his own salvation. Continuing, the spirit of independence and the false liberty, which is nowadays so rife among us, is a great enemy to the fear of God, and one of the miseries of our age is that there is little fear of God. Familiarity with God only too frequently usurps the place of that essential basis of the Christian life. Okay, you know those hymns, you know, um, I'm fortunately drawing a blank on those hymns, but basically those modern hymns in church which say essentially, God, aren't you grateful to us for being here? God, aren't you glad we're here? God, aren't you you know, overwhelmed by how wonderful we are? No. Or even, uh, um, you know, the, the, what's the hymn? Um, Yahweh, I know that you are near. I mean, the sentiment might be nice, but essentially calling God by his first name like that is, is not, is not, um, uh, what how uh, he said he says uh, familiarity with God too frequently takes the place of the essential basis of Christian life of fear of the Lord. There's a reason why you call people sir, right? <laughs> I mean, and people we don't call people sir anymore. It's kind of a shame. But um, you know, if if you are a peasant and you have to go face to face with the great Lord of the Manor who owns you and the other 10,000 inhabitants of your town, you call him sir. <laughs> you call him sir. It's kind of salutary um, acknowledgement of the distance between you. And, um, you know, it's avoiding an over-familiarity. Uh, the familiarity with God that characterizes our age too frequently takes the place of fear of the Lord, which is an essential basis of the Christian life. The result is that there's no progress in virtue, and such people are prey to illusion, and the sacraments which previously worked so powerfully in their souls are well nigh unproductive. Now, um, I, I want to be delicate when I say this, because I love the charismatic movement. I spent many years, um, addic- not addicted to the charismatic movement, but very, very enthusiastically participating at every chance I had at charismatic prayer meetings and so forth. And it's done a wonderful job of man- bringing many people closer to God. However, a- once in a while, you do see in the charismatic movement a tendency for a bunch of people to have decided they're already all saints. As a matter of fact, the charismatic gifts are a danger in that sense, because, you know, if you speak in tongues or if you um, have a gift of knowledge or so forth, uh, you know, you can get swelled up and you can uh, think that you've already made it to heaven, so to speak. And, you know, you're up there and you don't have too much to worry about anymore. Um, 
that paralyzes the progress in virtue, right? As as uh, Dom Guernje says, the result is that there's no progress in virtue. Such people are prey to illusion, the illusion that there's nothing wrong with you anymore, that you've, you know, you've made it. Remember when Jesus said, why do you worry about the speck in your brother's eye, but ignore the beam in your own eye? And well, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news and bad news for you is that you do have that beam in your eye. And I have that beam in my eye. And that is a characteristic of human nature. And it's not going to go away until we die. We are going to be blind to our own faults and much more sensitive to other people's faults. Period. And to think any to think that we don't have a beam in our eye is to uh, be prey to illusion. Um, it's a good idea to pray to become aware of your faults, especially if you can't think of what to confess. You might want to think about how you drive in traffic. <laughs> you might want to think about how you interact with pedestrians who are in your way on the street. Um, you might even want to just think about pedestrians who are in your way when you're walking on the sidewalk and, and they're blocking you. Um, we all have different beams in our eyes, but we all have beams in our eyes. So anyway, the result is that there's no progress in virtue. Such people are prey to illusion and the sacraments, which previously worked so powerfully in their souls are now well nigh unproductive. The reason is that the gift of fear has been superseded by conceited self complacency. Humility has no further sway. A secret and habitual pride has paralyzed the soul, and seeing that these people scout the very idea of their ever trembling before the great God of heaven, we may well ask them if they know who God is. Okay? So if... I don't know what scout means in this context. It must be a very old English, uh, old usage of the word in English. But if you scorn, so to speak, the very idea of trembling before the great God of heaven, it probably means you don't know who God is. Continuing. You know, if, if you're sitting there thinking, no, 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 Roy doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus's, you know, mercy. He doesn't know how, how, much Jesus loves us, and so forth. Maybe you're right. But maybe this is for you. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you might want to consider that possibility. Continuing. Therefore we beseech thee, O Holy Spirit, keep up within us the fear of God, which thou didst infuse into our hearts at our baptism. Remember, we're to pray for the fear of God as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thus saving, oh, this saving fear will ensure our perseverance in virtue, for it will oppose the growth of pride. Remember, pride is the number one enemy. Let it pierce our soul through and through, and ever abide with us as our safeguard. Let it bring down our haughtiness, and rouse us from tepidity, tepidity by ceaselessly reminding us of the greatness and holiness of him who is our creator and judge. Let's get back to Lucifer, right? the greatest creature ever created, who fell through the sin of pride. What would have been the cure? In other words, what one thing would have made Lucifer overcome his own pride and not succumb to his pride? It would have been a proper fear of who God is. Because however wonderful and great Lucifer was, he was nothing compared to God. So there's a natural... There's a natural um, interplay between pride and fear of the Lord. And the direct antidote to pride is fear of the Lord. Okay, continuing. This holy fear does not stifle the sentiment of love. On the contrary, it removes what would be a hindrance to its growth. The heavenly powers see and ardently love their God, their infinite and eternal good, and yet they tremble before his dread majesty. 
the the powers of heaven tremble that's a quote but i'm not sure where it looks like maybe from psalm 2 but i'm not sure and shall we covered as we are with the wounds of our sins disfigured by countless imperfections exposed on every side to snares obliged to fight with so many enemies shall we flatter ourselves that we can do without this strong and filial fear and that we need nothing to stimulate us when we are in those frequent trials a want of fervor in our will or of light in our mind o holy spirit watch over us preserve within us thy precious gift teach us how to combine peace and joy of heart with the fear of our lord and god according to those words of the psalmist serve ye the lord with fear and rejoice unto him with trembling amen it's my intention to go through all seven gifts of the holy spirit in the course of these days leading up to pentecost and for today it's just the fear of the lord so i will be stopping with the fear of the lord and i hope you watch the others Thank you for watching. Today is the gift of piety. The gift of the fear of God is intended as a cure for our pride. The gift of godliness is infused into our souls by the Holy Ghost. God, uh, Dom Garange is calling it godliness. It's usually called piety. I'm trying to substitute piety, but forgive me if I slip up from time to time. The gift of piety is infused into our souls by the Holy Ghost in order that we may resist self-love, which is one of the passions of our fallen nature and the second hindrance to our union with God. The heart of a Christian is not made to be either cold or indifferent. It must be affectionate and devoted. Otherwise, it can never attain the perfection for which God, who is love, has graciously created it. The Holy Ghost, therefore, puts the gift of piety into our soul by inspiring her with a filial affection for her Creator. You have received, says the Apostle, the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry to our God, Abba, Father. This disposition makes our soul alive to whatsoever regards God's honor. It enables man to nourish within him a sorrow for his sins in consideration of the divine mercy which has bor borne with and forgiven him, and of the sufferings and death of his Redeemer. It makes him thirst for God's glory to be ever spreading. He would, if he could, bring all his fellow creatures to adore this God. He feels most keenly every insult that is offered to so dear a king. His greatest joy is to see others growing in their love and devotedness in the service of the sovereign good. He is filled with filial submission to his heavenly Father, whose every will he is most ready to do, cheerfully resigned to whatsoever he may appoint. Now let me um, uh, interject something here. Uh, this is a topic that is very dear to Maria's heart, and it's very, very important. And I had never realized how connected it is to the gift of piety. And it is the following. There have been, has been a tendency in the church at various points in time for theologians, most of whom were celibate men, to dismiss the importance of emotions, of feelings. And to hold, for instance, that love is a matter of will, that the word love, to love, only means nothing other than to will the good of the other. So if you will the good of somebody, you're loving them. Emotions play no role, feelings play no role. And in fact, sometimes in the church, it has been taught or written that feelings are in some sense per se bad because they are by their nature kind of out of control and tend to lead people in the wrong direction and lead them into sin and it is your reason and your will 
which should direct you, and there is really no need for this faculty of emotions or feelings, which just cause trouble. Now, Dom Geringe is saying kind of the opposite here, and he's saying that we are made to love, God is love, um, and we have we need a life of feelings. We need a life of feelings. Um, and there are lots of these feelings that are very, very productive, very good, very serve our holiness, serve our sanctification. Um, if one is a celibate religious, say a Carthusian living in solitary confinement, you know, he's still a man and he has to love to be full. And ideally, the faculty of love, emotional love, heartfelt love, feeling love, is realized in his relationship with Jesus. And he loves Jesus. And it's a relationship of love, of the feeling of love with Jesus. We are to have compunction for our sins. We're to regret our sins. We're to mourn our sins. The saints wept over their sins. That's feelings. That's emotions to weep. Um, we are supposed to feel compassion for Jesus' sufferings. We're supposed to be upset and suffer with him, in a sense, because of how much we empathize with his sufferings. Those are feelings. Those are feelings. And so the Christian sanctification doesn't consist of negating our feelings, overriding our feelings, erasing our feelings. It consists in praying for the gift of feelings that advance us on the path of holiness, love of God, compunction for our sins, and so forth. And so, and that's what Dom Gerendre is saying here, right? He's saying, you know, the Holy Ghost puts the gift of piety in the soul, inspiring her with a filial affection for her creator. That's a feeling affection. That's not willing the good. That's a feeling. Um, you have received, says the apostle, the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry to our God, Abba, Father. That's a feeling. It's a feeling. It's a feeling of love of a, of a child loving his father. This disposition makes a soul alive to whatever regards God's honor, right? What about indignation at God being insulted? Right? That's a feeling, but that's that is a lively feeling that is is in the service of defending God's honor or caring about God's honor. Uh, it enables man to nourish with him in him a sorrow for his sins. That's a feeling. It's a feeling that we need. Um, it makes him thirst for God's glory. That thirst is a feeling. Do you see? So this is really neat. Because the way that um, Dom Geringe is defining the gift of piety is basically, it's the gift of having this entire range of feelings in the service of God, for the honor of God, you know, affection for God, defending God, and so forth, devotedness to God, feelings. Did you know that? I didn't know that. The gift of piety is the gift of having kind of like holy feelings. Uh, cheerful. Who's, um, uh, he is filled with filial submission to his heavenly Father, whose every will he is most ready to do, cheerfully resigned to whatever he may appoint. Cheerfulness, that's a feeling, right? The joy of doing a service for somebody you love. Those are feelings. Anyway, remember that um, I, I had some details wrong when I told the story of the little Japanese boy who ran to the his crucifix, to the, his cross, saying, which one's for me? When he, Which one's mine when he was about to be crucified? He turns out he was 12 and not 7. Um, I got some details wrong, but it's the story basically was nonetheless true. Imagine having that feeling of having so much of a desire to identify with Jesus, serve Jesus, suffer for Jesus, that you run up the hill to, to embrace the, the crucifix, the cross that you're about to be crucified on out of your love for Jesus. That's the gift of piety. Continuing, his faith is unhesitating and fervent. 
affectionately docile to the church, he is always in the disposition of mind to abandon his most cherished ideas the moment he discovers them to be in any way out of harmony with her teaching or practice, for he has an instinctive horror of novelties and insubordination. Every sentence, Dom Guerinje is describing feelings that lead us forward on the path of holiness. This devotedness to God, which results from the gift of piety and unites the soul to her creator by filial love, makes her love all God's creatures, insomuch as they are the work of his hands and belong to him. The blessed in heaven hold the first place in the fraternal affection of such a Christian. He has a most tender love for the Holy Mother of God and is zealous for her honor. He venerates the saints. He is a warm admirer of the courage of the martyrs and of the heroic actions of the servants of God. He delights in reading of their miracles and has a devotion to their sacred relics. If, if you had this text in front of you, the assignment would be underline each word, which is actually a reference to the feelings that we're praying for, the feelings that we want to have. For instance, in the last sentence, it was a long drawn out sentence, in fact, but it's one sentence. He has a most tender love for the Holy Mother of God. Okay, that's a feeling. And is zealous for her honor. Zeal is a feeling. He venerates the saints. Veneration is a feeling. He's a warm admirer of the courage of the martyrs. Admiration is a feeling. And of the heroic actions of the servants of God. He delights in reading of their miracles. That's another feeling. And has a devotion to their sacred relics. So that's six. Six feelings in that one sentence that... Um, essentially we're praying for when we, we pray for the gift of piety. But his love is not limited to the citizens of heaven. It is extended also to his fellow creatures here on earth, for the gift of godliness of piety makes him find Jesus in them. He is kind to everyone without exception. He forgives injuries, bears with the imperfections of others, and where an excuse is possible for his neighbor, he makes it. He has compassion on the poor and is attentive to the sick. His whole conduct is the index of a sterling warm-heartedness that weeps with them that weep and rejoices with them that rejoice. Jesus wept, right? Jesus wept over Lazarus in the tomb. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, over what was going to happen to Jerusalem. Feelings aren't bad. Um we wouldn't have any motivation, I'd argue, almost, if we didn't have feelings. Gosh, what kind of a, what kind of a, um, you know, robotic android would have uh, motivation without having feelings? I will do this because I am to do this, whether I want to or not. There are no feelings involved. It's like Dr. Spock, right? Or Mr. Spock, excuse me, on the Star Trek, Star on Star Trek, Starship Enterprise, Mr. Spock. He pretended to have no feelings, right? But there were always episodes where it turned out that he had feelings after all. Continuing, all this is found in those who use thy gift of piety, O Holy Spirit. By infusing it into our souls, you enable us to withstand the workings of our self-love, which would corrupt the heart. I'm would have to think about that for a moment, that what Dom Garanger is saying here is that actually we are going to love, <laughs> we are going to have feelings, and we are going to love, and if they're not directed out of ourselves to things that they should be directed to, they will be directed back to ourselves a self-love. And all of our affection and all of our love and all of our protectiveness and so forth, all of our compassion will be directed towards ourselves. That's interesting that the gift of piety is actually the cure, the, the antidote to the gift of self-love or not the gift of self-love, excuse me, the curse of self-love, the fault of self-love. So we saw yesterday that 
the fear of the Lord is the antidote to pride, and we're seeing today that piety, holy feelings, are the antidote to self-love. Okay, continuing. Um, all this is found in those who use thy gift of piety, O Holy Spirit. By infusing it into our souls, you enable us to withstand the workings of our self-love, which would corrupt the heart. You preserve us from that odious indifference to everyone around us, which dries up all feeling. You drive from us the sentiments of jealousy and hatred. Okay, because... Piety, which I always, before I read this, thought of as being only directed to God. If it works, see, piety is, seems like a very narrow word. I mean, you think it's referring to, you know, how enthusiastically you kneel at, at Mass or something. But it's a much bigger word than that. It's, it's the entire realm of human feelings directed towards God. And if we genuinely love God, we have to love um, anything he loves, we have to love. And he loves everybody else, <laughs> even the sinner he loves. And he, he wants them to convert and make it to heaven. So if we genuinely love God, our, our piety, our emotional flow into what God wants and what God loves should also be an antidote to jealousy and envy and indifference towards others. Because, um, because we know, basically because God has nothing but positive feelings towards all those others. You drive from us the sentiments of jealousy and hatred. Yes, piety inspired us with a filial love for our creator that softened the heart, and every creature of God became dear to us. O blessed Paraclete, grant that this gift may produce its rich fruits in us. Never permit us to stifle it by love of self. Our Jesus has told us that his heavenly Father makes his Son to rise upon the good and the bad. He would have us take this divine generosity as our model. Do thou, therefore, foster within us that germ of devotedness, kindness, and sympathy, which we received from thee on the day of our baptism, when thou first took possession of our souls. Amen. So, I'll just reread that last sentence. Our Jesus has told us that his heavenly Father makes his Son to rise upon the good and the bad. That's in St. Matthew. He would have us take this divine generosity as our model. Do thou, therefore, foster within us that germ of devotedness, kindness, and sympathy, which we receive from thee on the day of our baptism, when thou first took possession of our souls. Amen. Thank you for watching, and um, I hope you join us again for the next episode. Regina Celi Eta